she is encouraged by the encampment removals, which have reduced the number of tents in the area around her hotel. But she said government officials needed to compel more homeless people into mental health and addiction services. A lot of people say, how do we get the old Portland back? Ms. Burke said. I think we need to look at the lessons learned from this time and to get to something else. Anthony's day while some debate the city's future, Mr. Hollenbeck has been focused on the immediate needs of his homeless neighbors. Before leaving for a trip in early March, Mr. Hollenbeck checked in on Mr. Saldana. You need anything, Anthony? When there was no answer from inside the tent, Mr. Hollenbeck figured his neighbor was sleeping. Two weeks later, when Mr. Hollenbeck returned, there was still no sign of Mr. Saldana. Haven't seen you around lately. Hope you are good, Mr. Hollenbeck wrote in an email to Mr. Saldana on April 13. Five days later, the police received a call about a body found by a worker preparing to remove Mr. Saldana's tent. According to a police report, the body had been unnoticed for several weeks, and investigators struggled to identify him through fingerprints. Eventually, the police determined it was Mr. Saldana. He died from a fentanyl overdose, his sister said. Not long after his friend's death, Mr. Hollenbeck got word that the insurance company was offering to compensate Mr. Saldana for the injuries he sustained when he was hit by the car. He would have received $16,600, enough to cover many months of rent. The conditions that we have created as a society didn't let me get that money to him in time, Mr. Hollenbeck said. That is something that haunts me. Ms. Richardson appreciates what Mr. Hollenbeck did to support and comfort her brother and she will hold on to the image of her brother standing up to protect his young neighbor. It was Portland at its best, and proof to her that the city's ethos of community endures. But in the end, that wasn't enough to save her brother from the hurt that followed him wherever he went. The last time she saw him was on February 26 when he visited her house for an Anthony day. He hated having his picture taken, so when she saw him asleep in the living room that day, Ms. Richardson secretly snapped a photo. He was stretched out on the couch, which was draped in a large blanket pattern like the American flag. His head rested where the stars and stripes came together. Ms. Richardson posted the image on Facebook after his death. I love you Anthony, she wrote, and know that you are now at peace. The next day, she headed out with her team to check on their Lou Key Coral Nursery, a site that they'd carefully built out over the last two years off Big Pine Key. In May, they'd met a goal of installing 100 coral nursery structures there. Now, as they approached by boat, they could see the white of the bleached coral below. The team embraced in a group hug before jumping in. When they resurfaced, Ms. Thomason called her boss, crying so hard that at first he couldn't understand her. Everything in Luki is lost, she told him, some 5,400 pieces of elkhorn and staghorn coral. The two sites appear to be among the hardest hit. But throughout Florida's reef, which stretches some 350 miles, Scientists and advocates are doing triage. First priority has been salvaging samples of the most threatened species of coral. Before the marine heat wave, there were only about 150 genetic individuals of elkhorn and 300 of staghorn left in the whole state. Coral can reproduce asexually, making clones of themselves, so separate corals can have the same genes. Divers fanned out across the reef and offshore nurseries, collecting two fragments of each genetic individual. Those were taken to tanks and holding facilities, then loaded onto trailers and driven to two separate locations that will serve as gene banks. It's a last-ditch sort of insurance policy, said Jennifer Moore, who is leading the banking effort and coordinates protected coral recovery for NOAA Fisheries Southeast Region. God forbid everything dies in the water, we still have not lost those individuals. Coral reefs occur in less than 1% of the ocean, but about 25% of all marine life depends on them at some point including fish that provide a critical source of protein to millions of people. Reefs also protect shorelines from storms, breaking the energy of waves by an average of 97%, researchers have found. Worldwide, the goods and services provided by reefs have been valued at $2.7 trillion a year. Yet they are imperiled. In 2018, the United Nations Scientific Panel on Climate Change noted that the fate of coral reefs hangs in the balance between a global temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius and a rise of 2 degrees Celsius. The smaller figure would cause further declines of 70 to 90 percent, the scientists said. The larger one would bring losses of more than 99 percent. While migration can help animals and plants adapt to a warming planet, coral reefs require very specific ocean conditions and take decades, 
centuries or millenniums to build. The pace of climate change is too fast. Fanner Montoya Maya, a marine biologist with the Coral Restoration Foundation, said. Without drastic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the world is on track to warm 2.1 to 2.9 degrees by 2100, according to the United Nations. Stressed corals bleach, meaning they expel the algae that give them color and nourishment. If conditions don't improve, or if bleaching happens too frequently, the corals will die. Mass bleaching events were unheard of a half century ago, but they've been increasing in frequency and severity since the 1980s. By some estimates, the world has lost half of its coral cover since 1950. The coral reefs of the Florida Keys have suffered a sharp decline since the late 1970s, primarily because of disease and bleaching, both of which are directly linked to increasing ocean temperatures, Dr. Manzello said. You talk about canaries in the coal mine, he said. These canaries have been dying now for 40 years. The losses have inspired scientists and enthusiasts to intervene, propelling the field of coral restoration. Ken Nettemeyer, for example, stepped away from a successful business as a tropical fish wholesaler some 20 years ago to throw himself into growing staghorn and elkhorn coral in offshore nurseries and planting them on Florida's reef. He went on to found Coral Restoration Foundation and then a newer non-profit group, Reef Renewal USA, which he still runs. He has dealt with bleaching and hurricanes before, but these past couple of weeks have shaken him like never before. I don't really know how to process it, Mr. Nettemeyer said. To be clear, he hasn't stopped working. It has been a whirlwind of gathering genetic samples, finding space for coral in tanks on land, applying for emergency permits to move nurseries to deeper, cooler water. But for the first time, he said, he's questioning whether such efforts can be successful over the long term. Last year, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States went up, not down. Globally, emissions were on target to hit a record high. I keep thinking, what's it going to take to get people's attention? Mr. Nettemeyer asked. David Obora, a marine biologist and co-chairman of the Coral Specialist Group for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, praised certain restoration efforts but noted that without climate action, they are all but useless. With the main drivers of impact continuing to rise, they may just buy time, for just a few years, Dr. Obora wrote in an email. It is of course critical to attempt this, but this must not distract focus on addressing what and who is causing the problem. As the natural warming cycle of El Niño is compounded by climate change, he expects several years of massive coral bleaching around the world. Beyond Florida, bleaching is already underway in reefs off the Bahamas, Belize, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, El Salvador, Mexico and Panama. Ms. Thomason returned to Lu Key on Friday, getting her first look at the reef where she'd hoped to one day plant the now dead young coral from the nursery. Thickets of wild elkhorn and mounds of brain coral were bleached or already dead. She clung to the knowledge that her group sites in the upper keys were faring better, so far. Ms. Thomason is determined to keep working on coral restoration, but she needs an ocean hospitable to corals for them to return to. It's up to everyone else to demand climate action right now, Ms. Thomason said. Not in a year, not tomorrow, but right now. Actually yesterday.